Welcome again. Today we consider topic 2.6.4. Describe the principles associated with survivorship curves, including K and R strategists. As we look at that specific objective, we will survey a range of organisms. Before we consider that, though, we would like to look at 2.6.3 and try as much as possible to make some connections between the role of density dependent and density independent factors and internal and external factors in the regulation of the population. The factors that limit the growth of populations, the factors that determine whether or not a population would have a J-shaped type curve or an S-shaped type curve are these limiting factors and some of these factors are directly related to the number of organisms that live within a given space the population density basically and these factors all stem from high population densities but there are some factors that regardless of whether you have 100 or 100,000 organisms these factors would have a similar impact. They include natural events like hurricanes, earthquakes, volcanoes and the abiotic factors which regulate climate and the weather. Another way of separating limiting factors. Internal and external. And it's important to realize that when we say internal factors, we mean factors that are internal to a population of a specific organism. So within a population of mice, the size of the breeding area or the fertility, these are factors from within the population. It also includes competition for food within the members of that population. So food could be included within internal factors. But at the same time, there are other organisms of other species on the outside of that population that also compete for food. So there is intraspecific and interspecific competition. So factors like food and competition could go either way. But some factors that are clearly external include diseases, natural events, predators, and abiotic factors. Leatherbacks, critically endangered. Finally on our list is the humpback whale, Megaptera novae angliae, with a gestation period of 11.5 months. Put simply, it means it takes 11 and a half months for a mother whale to give birth to her one calf, and she spends several years taking care of this calf, 
giving it a protein rich milk so therefore parental care is very high very similar to the elephant so did you see a trend with all of these animals that we looked at on the y-axis we've got a log scale with one at the bottom followed by a 10 up here and then the distance between 10 and 100 being the same as the distance between 1 and 10. This is characteristic of a log scale to show these big changes in numbers. Over on this side, the x-axis, we have tried to quantify parental investment. And we see here that things like the elephant, which has a gestation of 22 months, and the whale with a gestation of 11.5 months just to give birth to the one, at most two, offspring and to spend several years taking care of, of the calf. Compare that to a mouse or a rat that produces 10 to 15 in a litter and every month it's possible for an adult female rat to reproduce. Large numbers also for centipedes even larger numbers for creatures like mosquitoes. So there's this trend. The more offspring an organism has, the less parental care it tends to give. Organisms that live in places that have changing environments have high reproductive capacity and they get favored in the struggle for existence because these kinds of environments favored things that have short gestation periods, large numbers of offspring that develop very rapidly. The R strategist. Some creatures like polar bears and human beings, monkeys, elephants, they tend to have just a few offspring and they spend a lot of time and effort nurturing these offspring. These organisms tend to live in very stable climax type communities where the carrying capacity which is termed K is limited and because of this struggle for existence in this highly competitive and limiting situation it's advantageous to have less offspring and to invest more time in caring for these offspring. This simple understanding and description of reproductive strategies as K or R is today described as very simplistic and somewhat naive and you do have new papers being put out there such as this one up here by Resnick, Bryant and Bashi that says R and K selection revisited the role of population regulation so while we're using these terms R and K selection, it's just for me to point out that biologists are in the moment reflecting on how valid this theory of R and K selection is. But with all of that said, it's still very useful for us to define one type of organism as K selected and another type as R selected. A K selected type would include the polar bear and an R selected type would include the toad. K selected species are those that usually concentrate their reproductive investment in a small number of offspring thus increasing their survival rate and adapting them for living in long-term climax community. And the R selection type are the species that tend to spread their reproductive investment among a large number of offspring so that they are well adapted to colonize new habitats rapidly and make opportunistic use of short-lived resources. With this classification made, it's also useful to add some traits to what makes an organism a K type and what makes an organism an R type. But as I mentioned before, the whole classification system is quite simplistic and therefore it's likely that you will only find 
a range of organisms that are very difficult to classify as R and K. Perhaps there's one that was presented on the lesson here today that you might find it's contentious and you can't decide whether it belongs in K or in R. But let's list some characteristics of K selected species are large, long lives. They have few offspring. On the other hand, the R strategists tend to have short lives. Generally, they are small, very reproductive. Consider this question. Where do R and K strategists belong? Things like elephants that don't have many offspring. They take good care of them and they tend to live very long. Are K strategists. Things like mice that have a lot more offspring, but many of these offspring die at a very early stage in the life of the organism, with only a few of them living to the full lifespan. Those are the R strategists. And then there's the in-between type, sometimes known as the C strategy. As we close today, I would like you to consider a plant example. And in your picture, we've got some moss, which we've discussed before. These moss tend to be pioneers. They tend to be the first organisms to colonize bare rock. These moss here in this picture are producing sporophytes, release thousands, perhaps millions of gametes into the moist environment, seeking to have fertilization occur and to produce new organisms. But you don't get millions of new moss developing. You only get hundreds or thousands developing. In addition to that, I want you to classify the moss as either K or R selected and give a couple reasons to support your choice. And then finally, sketch a survivorship curve for this moss and be prepared to explain why you chose that particular curve.